This is the sixth week. Uh, we're going to tackle chapter six, uh, evolution of brain and behavior. We're going to look uh, to see how the brain evolved over time, why we have such a large brain and why other animals don't. This is, this is all theoretical. I'm, everything, everything that we talk about in physiological psych is theoretical. There's a possibility that there are exceptions. There's a possibility that uh, despite the fact that uh, scientists have been studying these things for an extended length of time, excuse me, for, for an ex extended length of time, that um, that these these things are inaccurate, uh, or there are uh, inaccuracies about them. So when we talk about evolution, what we're really talking about is a theory of evolution. Um, it's we can't go back in time and watch things progress. Uh, so uh, everything is theoretical, as 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 interesting as that is. So let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Uh, modern scientists see the study of change of life over the ages due to natural selection and sexual se selection as beneficial to understanding humanity from more than just a current snapshot view. Uh, this can be done through DNA and analysis uh, where scientists compare the DNA of one species with another. For example, we know the DNA of chimpanzees only differs from human DNA by 1.6%. 1.6% is not a lot. Um, there is more variation between groups of chimpanzees than there are of all the humans on, on Earth. Now, you like to think of, uh, of, of yourself as unique, but the reality is, whether you're uh, a pale-faced uh, European or whether you are a very dark-faced African, uh, the DNA, your DNA is almost identical. Uh, there are, and this is one of the reasons why when we do DNA studies trying to identify somebody, it's not that difficult. And the reason it's not that difficult is because there aren't that many variations. There aren't that many uh, different variables. Uh, there are, are uh, billions of, um, of DNA structures in everybody's DNA and everybody's chromosomes. But uh, as far as humans are concerned, uh, we're really, really close, a lot closer than we are to chimpanzees, but it's still only 1.6%. So the difference between one group of chimpanzees that live fairly close to each other, their DNA is, is, is actually more variable than human DNA. So humans haven't been around for all that long, um, the structure that we have now, the, uh, the human structure. And that's one of the reasons why humans... Uh, are very similar all over the world. We have the same uh, structure. Most of the things that are different between you, me, and, and uh, uh, someone from New Guinea or someone from, uh, from Africa uh, is the is skin tone. I, and that's it. And, and maybe facial features. And those are really unimportant things. What we're really talking about, the important things, are, are the brain structure uh, and your ability to think and to adapt. And of course, uh, this is the way we look at things. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is the primate. These are all primates. And uh, the common chimpanzee uh, is, is, this is a pygmy chimpanzee, which is also known as a bonobo. And there's, there are humans, of course. And so we're really close to each other. Scientists have been toying with the idea of evolution for a couple of centuries before Charles Darwin and Alfred Ru Russell Wallace uh, published their findings in 1858. They actually published right about the same time, but Darwin won the, the race. And uh, Darwin and Russell were very similar. Uh, there were very few uh, differences between the, the, the two, but of course we, uh, we talk about Darwin and we never talk about Wallace, even though Wallace wrote just like Darwin did. Darwin actually published first, though he had been working on his theory for almost for almost 30 years. So he could have published earlier. Uh, and it, it was where they published as to what was important. Uh, the, the reality is that uh, the first flight was not in Kitty Hawk in, in North Carolina. The first flight for the Wright brothers was in Kitty Hawk in North Carolina. Uh, there were others who had flown before, but it was the 
they were the ones that uh, that created commercial more, a more commercial flight. And it's kind of the same way with these theories. Um, Darwin is the one that's more widely accepted than Russell, than Wallace, I'm sorry, than Wallace. And uh, the reason is because because he published at the uh, Royal, uh, they were actually one Scottish and the other one is, is uh, English. Uh, but Russell was, uh, at, he published at a more, I'm sorry, Darwin published at a more prestigious institution. 1859, Darwin published On the Origins of Species by Means of Natural Selection, and that is the, the, the book. You can still get it. Uh, there it is uh, in its original. Uh, Darwin made three main observations. <clears throat> the first observation was that individuals of a given species are not identical. Uh, some of the variations are inheritable, and not all offspring survive, and that's... Uh, a, a, those are all three very important points. Darwin would later add a fourth corollary, that of sexual selection. Sexual selection states that each sex exerts selective pressures on the other in terms of both anatomical and behavioral features that favor reproductive success, hence the strange anatomical features of some creatures. And if you've ever seen a cardinal flying across uh, 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 in the air, uh, you know that you can see a cardinal from from miles, almost miles away. You can see them from from uh, a mile away at least. Uh, they're the only red thing around. Now, why in the world would they do that? Why in the world would cardinals be red? Well, it's almost like they're making a target out of themselves. And the answer is because that's what the female uh, cardinal uh, wants. The redder the uh, cardinal, the re redder the male, the more likely that she will have. Uh, will reproduce with them. It's the same way with the mandrel. This is a mandrel right here, as you can see. Now, why in the world would they have a red nose and, and uh, blue on nature? Uh, as far as mammals are concerned, uh, this, this is the only blue in uh, mammals. We uh, Other mammals don't have blue, and they don't really have that bright a red either. So why did they do that on the answer and the yellow beard? Uh, the answer is because that's what the females wanted to reproduce with. Uh, so in time, of course, the mandrel became brighter and brighter and brighter. And it's the same way with the peacock's tail. As you can see, the peacock's tail is, is so large that it's almost uh, unwieldy to, to the extent all they can do is hop. Uh, well, they can fly, but they can only fly for very short distances because this tail is heavy. And of course, the larger the tail, the more likely uh, that uh, that the uh, individual uh, will be able to reproduce. So I guess the question is, do humans participate in sexual selection? Uh, these are the uh, Babila women of, uh, of uh, Africa. And as you can see, uh, in this group of individuals uh, having a large lower lip, that is their lower yeah that's a lower lip um, having a large lower lip is is attractive and so the women in order to uh, to, to attract males will have a, a plate put in their in their lips uh, the the Chinese for the longest time uh, wanted women to have delicate uh, feet and uh, so they were were seeking women with tiny feet. And as you can see, this is a woman with, with tiny feet. The tinier the feet, the, the more sexual or the more, the more attractive they were to the males. And what they would do, they would bind the feet uh, from a fairly young age, uh, making them as tiny as they possibly could. And they do that by folding the toes underneath uh, and making them just really small. So, uh, I can remember reading a book about Chiang Kai-shek uh, in the 1920s. He was a uh, he was an officer in the Chinese military, and uh, he was at a party, and they were they were bidding uh, for to drink out of a slipper, and it was the this tiny little slipper that uh, this very attractive uh, woman with very very small feet uh, wore, and uh, that. And he won. He he paid the most money or whatever, and he was able to drink out of her shoe. Uh, 
out of our tiny little sliver. Um, these are the uh, flatheads of, uh, of the Northwest. Uh, the flatheads were mountain people. And when Lewis and Clark went through there, uh, they found that, that uh, they, they, they thought that the only attractive uh, people were uh, the ones that had the sloped forehead. Uh, so they would this they would do this to their their infants. Uh, if you go down to South America uh, and and look at the Inca and the Aztec, they would do the same thing. Uh, there were some really strange shaped uh, skulls that we saw down in uh, when we were in uh, in South America in Peru. So those are the flatheads. Um, of course, they don't. Nobody does this anymore. Uh, so Europeans, are they, are they exempt here? We have the Chinese, we have the Africans, we have uh, American Indians. So were the Europeans exempt from this uh, strange um, idea that, of what beauty was? And the answer is no. The corset, uh, if you ever watch uh, Gone with the Wind, which I, for, for some reason I, I don't think they're, they're going to be showing it as much as they used to. But uh, uh, Scarlett O'Hare, of course, is... Uh, when she's getting ready for the party, uh, she's getting cinched up in one of these things. It wasn't this extreme, of course. Uh, but, uh, yeah, uh, Europeans did some pretty stupid things as well. And having a, a slender waist or a waist this size was something that they were seeking. Uh, scarification uh, is common around the world. Uh, as you can see, this is uh, scars in a select pattern. Uh, we already saw the uh, we already saw two groups. Uh, who did we see? Uh, I can't think of what their names are. They were right next to each other, and they had uh, scars on their faces that were in different patterns. And of course, that's how you tell the difference between one and the other. Uh, this is a Cherokee uh, Indian in Oklahoma, and this is a uh, well, uh, a pygmy. And as you can see, uh, one is probably two feet taller than the other. Uh, the Cherokee were very tall people. Uh, and uh, you can see the difference between the two. Um, so what, what does that mean? That means in Cherokee country, uh, the taller guy is, is probably going to uh, be, fi be found more attractive by, the, by, by women. Uh, in Africa, my goodness, there's certainly some uh, tall people in Africa. But the pygmies, of course... They select uh, men by their ability to hunt, and uh, so they, they also select them for success in hunting. They live in the rainforest, uh, so being tall uh, would be a disadvantage. Uh, so they are looking for a good hunter, uh, and uh, sexual selection, of course, they select the shorter individual. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is the uh, tattoos of a... Uh, a Maori in uh, New Zealand, and as you can see, that's what pretty is in New Zealand. Uh, these women have, as you can see, their ears are really long. They've got weighted uh, earrings. This is a, a white guy sitting beside them. Uh, he probably told them a joke, and that's why they're laughing. But as you can see, this is attractive in that part of Thailand. Uh, these are the mountain women of Thailand, um, of also of Thailand. Uh, they uh, put uh, rings around their necks, and what they're doing, actually, they thought for for the longest time, they thought they were expanding their spinal column so that their cervical uh, spinal portion of their spinal column was stretched. Uh, but the reality is that uh, these rings are heavy and they weigh down the, the clavicle, they weigh down the shoulders. I think I've got a picture of it. Nope, no. Uh, anyway, so that's that's what they do. And, and of course, in that portion of Thailand, uh, the woman with the longer neck, uh, it means, for one thing, that they have enough money to buy more of these metal rings. Uh, they were gold for once upon a time. Now they're brass, of course. Uh, these are the Maasai of, uh, of Africa, and uh, the Maasai, um, the, uh, tall, the, far, the higher you can jump, uh, the, uh, the more attractive you are to, uh, 
to women, to the Messiah women. Uh, I can't remember what these guys are, what their name is. They're sub-Saharan, they're part of sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, but they, um, in, in their tribe, uh, it's the men that get all dressed up and painted up and, uh, they are considered attractive if they can move their eyes independently of one another. And of course, uh, I have interesting facial expressions at the same time. And of course, uh, some people find jewelry attractive. That's uh, out there somewhere. These are both women. <laughs> uh, okay, so that's sexual selection. Understanding the phylogeny of uh, of species allows us to st study the behavioral and neural adaptations that allowed animals to exploit particular ecological niches. Comparative studies may focus on specific differences between closely related species or may be concerned with general principles across larger numbers of species, but in each case, the use of an evolutionary framework provides additional explanatory power. And of course, this is what we, we're trying to understand what happened in the past so that we can predict what's going to happen in the future. And that's the idea of looking at evolution. Classification, uh, this is, these are, uh, these are mammals. All these are mammals from the Norway rat over, and that's an insect, and of course that's a bird, an ave. Okay, but they're all animalia. They're all chordata. Uh, because they all have uh, backbones. Uh, these five are mammalia, and this is an avis, and this is an insecta. Uh, and uh, we can go deeper than that. The principles of neural function revealed by the comparative anatomy studies may often be generalized to many species, including humans. And of course, uh, we like to think of we like to talk about the brain because humans have the bigger a, a bigger brain than uh, than uh, a lot of other animals. Not the biggest brain, of course, because some animals are much much larger than humans, like the whale and and uh, and whatnot. Uh, but they have uh, every everyone has a brain, and the idea is who has the biggest brain as far as we're concerned, because that is something that we. Uh, that, that uh, makes us different from other animals. The major divisions of the brain are shared by all vertebrates. <clears throat> brain differences between species of vertebrates can often be directly related to their ecology and behavioral complexity. And of course this shows the skulls and the brains of uh, various animals. There's the human. This is the gorilla, I believe. And that's the orangutan. Such differences tend to be quantitative in nature. Relative size of brain regions or the size of neurons is a good example. The field of classifying animals is known as taxonomy. Taxonomy is an ongoing endeavor. A taxonomy can be done in many ways, including paleontology, studying the fossil remains, uh, comparing animal DNA with human DNA, uh, putting paleontological uh, information with DNA analysis in a study called convergent evolution. Two of the fastest swimmers in the ocean are tuna and dolphins, each evolved for if <laughs> efficient swimming, and so there are similarities in their structure. However, the dolphin is a mammal and the tuna is a fish. Similar features due to convergent evolution is called homoplasy, uh, similar development. So there was similar development between these two creatures. Uh, they both developed uh, a great deal of speed when they swim, but as you can see, uh, well, one's a mammal and the other's a fish. So there's a lot of differences between them. But they developed in, in similar manners because they had similar needs, and this is known as homoplasy. Homology, study of similarities, looks at similarities between body structures of animals with common ancestry. A good example of homology 
is the forelimb of several mammals. Uh, outwardly, they seem so different, but the structure is very similar. Analogy refers to two structures that have similar functions. So this is homology of the, uh, of the arm. This is a human arm. This is a dog's foreleg, as you can see. They run on their toes. Uh, the seal's flipper. Uh, the, the, the hands are at the end of the flipper. Uh, and the bat's wings, of course. The ends of the wings are the fingers. Classification of species begins in general terms and runs to more and more specific. Kingdom is the, the most general term. Uh, living creatures are broken into five kingdoms. Animalia, uh, plantae, fungi, monera, which are bacteria, and protista, which are single-cell animals. Uh, the main subdivision of, of a kingdom is a phylum. Uh, three phyla are chordata, mollusca, and anthropoda. Uh, chordata, of course, are uh, uh, animals with, uh, with spinal columns. Uh, mollusks, are, um, um, <laughs> mollusks are shelled animals that don't have uh, backbones. And then anthropoda would be the insect-type structures. The main subdivision of a phylum is, a, is class. Uh, some classes within the phylum chordata uh, mammal mammalia, avis, and reptilia. Uh, mammalia, of course, are, are uh, ma mammals. Uh, avis are birds, and reptilia are reptiles. Uh, the main subdivision of a class is an order. Uh, some orders within the class mammalia are carnivora, herbivora, and primates. Primates, of course, are humans and the great apes. Uh, herbivora are, are animals that eat, uh, eat plants and carnivora are animals that eat meat. The main subdivision of the order is the family such as canidae and felidae. Uh, the main subdivision of a family is, the, well, wait a minute, let's talk about the canidae and the felidae. The canidae and felidae refer to, what are we talking about here? Uh, um, our dogs, the candidae are our dog are what we could think of as dogs, and the felidae are foxes. That's not right. I'm thinking of Canis and Vulpus. Um, what is the candidae? Well, let's look it up. Let's look it up because I can't remember right off the top of my head. Felidae. Family of mammals, uh, colloquially referred to as cats. I'm sorry, that's right. Felis, felis, felines. Okay, so that's, oops, I'm sorry. Uh, so one is a dog. Uh, Canidae are, are the dogs, and the fel felidae are the, the f cats. Wow. Okay. Oh, wait a minute, I'm on the wrong thing. Okay. Um, the main subdivision of a family is a genus, uh, such as Canis and Vulpus. Vulpus is uh, foxes, and Canis are dogs, uh, wolves and dogs. Uh, the main subdivision of a genus is a species, such as Canis familiaris, and this is Canis familiaris. These are the dogs that we have domesticated. While Darwin's uh, theory was widely accepted, no one really knew or understood how change took place until the biologist uh, Hugo de Vries. Uh, working with primroses, uh, de Vries provided uh, that sudden, uh, pro proved that sudden changes were caused spontaneously by mutations. A good example, this is a ruby red uh, grapefruit. Uh, ruby red grape grapefruits used to look like this because there were so many seeds in them. Uh, but then they had a mutation where they didn't produce seeds. So now that, that's what we try to grow. Usually, uh, if you get a ruby red uh, uh, grapefruit, uh, it won't have any seeds in it. And it's because of a mutation once upon a long time ago. Well, once upon about uh, 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Genetic studies subsequently demonstrated that chromosomes provided the building blocks of inheritance. Later, genes were identified as the building blocks of chromosomes. Watson and Crick demonstrated that DNA was arranged in a double helix, 
uh, made up of nucleic acids. And this is what a double helix looks like. The two things match together. Today, the Modern Genome Project gives us an ever-expanding view of the makeup of humans as compared to other creatures. And that's what the Genome Project actually strangely looks like. Researchers have determined that species who have, uh, have to hunt for their food, such as humans and carnivores, have bigger brains than animals who don't have to search for their food, such as ungulates. And the ungulates would be uh, the hoofed animals, uh, any, any herbivore, uh, especially deer. And of course, these are, these are the hunters down here, these two blonde-headed, blue-eyed young ladies. She's got, what does she have? That's a muffin. She's got bacon down here. She also looks like she's got uh, uh, some kind of egg thing going, I think, and, and a glass of orange juice and water, of course. They're the hunters. And these, this is the hunted. The more novel the means of obtaining food, the larger the forebrain of the animal. Magpies have been known to dig up potatoes. Uh, house sparrows have been seen picking the insects from car radiator grills. Crows have been known to drop rock-hard palm nuts in front of cars that run over them and open them. This is a magpie, this is a sparrow, and that is a crow. Birds who store food will have a larger hippocampus than birds who don't. The hippocampus is necessary for memory, thus a larger one is needed for those species that rely on memory for survival. Uh, this is the acorn woodpecker. This is Clark's Nutcracker, and this, no, that's the Chickadee. This is a Chickadee, and this is a Nutcracker. That's the, this is a black cap Chickadee, obviously. You can see the black cap on that Chickadee. And then this is the Clark's Nutcracker. The difference between the brains of humans and the brains of other mammals are, are mostly quantitative. Rats and humans are similar in that each has a brain that represents about 2% of the total body weight. The basic differences have mostly to do with the size of the cere cerebrum of the human and the prominent increases in surface due to the gyri and the sulci. And as we, you can see, we can compare rats' brains and human brains. The rat's brain is much smaller because the rat is much smaller. Uh, but as you can see, different structures uh, dominate in each uh, in each animal. The thalamus, for example, is is quite large in the uh, in the rat, and not nearly as large in the as by proportion, of course, uh, in the human. Rats don't miss uh, miss out completely. Of course, uh, they have a much larger olfactory bulb than humans, and so have a much stronger sense of smell. And this is what they actually look like. That's a rat's brain. That's a human brain. And I think that's a chimpanzee's brain. The nervous system of vertebrates uh, have several similarities. Uh, they develop from a hollow dorsal neural tube. Uh, they show bilateral symmetry. Uh, segmentation is present. Pairs of spinal nerves extend from each level of the spinal uh, cord. Uh, the central nervous system and the peripheral nervous system are separate. Localization is present. Certain functions are controlled by certain locations in the central nervous system. Anthropologists and comparative biologists assume that all vertebrates have these features in common because they descended from a common ancestor. Invertebrates are another story. There are 17 phyla to cover the invertebrates, while vertebrates are part of one. It has been estimated that for every human on Earth, there are over one billion insects. The basic plan, all vertebrates and most invertebrates uh, share a basic plan that consists of a central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system. And as you can see, here's the uh, central nervous system. This is the brain and the spinal column. Here's the peripheral nervous system, everything else. And it's exactly the same in the grasshopper. All vertebrates and many invertebrates, include mollusks and insects, have brains. The general evolutionary trend in both vertebrates and invertebrates is toward increasing brain control over ganglia at lower levels of the body.
axons of mammalians, uh, mammalian neurons are surrounded by myelin, uh, which helps them conduct impulses faster. Invertebrates have no myelin to speed nerve conduction. If we look at present creatures and their fossilized ancestors, we can see that the brain has changed over time, whether it is a bird's brain or a hominid brain. Making a cast of the inside of a skull to map the brain is referred to as an endocast. And this is us today. And of course, these are different uh, individuals in our evolutionary tree. And there we go. Uh, the, oops, I'm sorry. The reality is, if we look at all proto-humans or, or uh, creatures that came before modern humans, we can see that the brain was relatively small until we got down to Neanderthal man. Now, the reality is, if we weighed this brain and we measured this brain, Neanderthal brain would be much would be larger than modern humans. Uh, they averaged. Uh, right at uh, 1700 uh, cc's and the human brain the modern human brain is about 250 cc's less than that and there we go <clears throat> and that is the end of the chapter okay so i'll talk to you next week